paper in little Timmy's operation. <laughs> so, um, where's the... Uh, so the uh, topic I, 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 uh, I was asked to speak about is this issue of the thousand gangers disease, which is a, uh, an interesting situation that involves uh, pretty much black wall that I'll talk about. But it's, again, it's a very unusual kind of uh, si uh, situation involving both a uh, insect and a pathogen, a fungus. Uh, the uh, two species involved will be a fungus. I'll keep saying this name, Geospithium wormida. We don't have a common name for that. The beetle, I'll call the walnut twig beetle. That's its common name. So these are the two things that work in concert. Uh, oops, uh, I don't want to change the color scheme. I know it needs to improve performance. Charlie's coming. Charlie's coming. Charlie's coming. Someone's complaining about my color scheme. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, current uh, distribution of this insect was, uh, is sent to the entire western U.S. Uh, it was first found uh, in the eastern U.S. in 2010 in Knoxville. It's subsequently been found in uh, Virginia, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and most recently a spot in Ohio, um, a spot in North Carolina, and a spot in, the, uh, uh, in uh, Maryland. Uh, and uh, as of three months ago, we also apparently have successfully exported this uh, to Italy. So it's now in Europe, which uh, will probably mean there's going to be some implications in terms of export markets. Because of this. Uh, the uh, couple key points I want to make with this is the, some of our talked about the disease is it develops from two organisms, and you have to think of both of them together, but they are always together. Uh, the causal organisms are native to North America, which is kind of, kind of different. You know, MLF work came from. Uh, Asia. This one came from um, Mexico, Arizona, or Southern California. Uh, um, I should uh, it kills susceptible uh, plants through um, uh, production of little cankers, which are little dead areas that the fungus can produce. Uh, there are multiple cankers uh, uh, causing expression of disease. It has been rapid in the western U.S. I mean, we have been devastated. Uh, we, there, there are communities in, in Colorado that have lost all their black walnut, 100%. Uh, <coughs> have lost a high percentage or are in the process of doing that. But there are some indications, this is the good news, there are some indications that it will be a lot different, slower disease in the eastern U.S., including the northern parts where you are. And I'll, I'll have the, those will be positive things I'll say at the end. So I'm going to have a lot of gloomy stuff, and then you get depressed, and hopefully it'll be a little more positive at the end. The uh, management options are limited, and the uh, big emphasis uh, that, that present really needs to be in terms of containing it. We can't uh, we can't uh, squander uh, precious time on managing this insect by having people in the the best of the world. have to stop. Um, and that's how, that's how it's going to be. That's how we get to here. So basically, the two organisms are this beetle, uh, uh, Pityopterus juglandus, the walnut twig beetle, and this uh, fungus, Geosmithia morbida. The uh, beetle, uh, shown here, is, uh, uh, is, is pretty characteristic in terms of features if you look at it closely. It is a tiny thing. I, I mean, th this is in the bark beetle family, and, and many of you know of bark beetles, like hips beetles, or uh, things like that. And, uh, and, and those are small insects. This makes a, a hips beetle looks like an elephant. These are, these are little, tiny bark beetles. Um, so here's a whole bunch of them sitting on Lincoln's head. Uh, and, uh, that's a, a, a much smaller bark beetle than you'd be uh, aware of uh, if you have some, some understanding of these. Uh, but again, there are some features if you really want to get into it, if you were somebody who wanted to identify with this, this bark beetle, I just caught in this trap, a, a uh, uh, walnut twig beetle. There are some features like some really nice uh, um, rows of spines on the head you could use to identify it if, if you want to look at that. Some nice things, features on the butt end too, if you'd like to look at butt ends of beetles. <laughs> uh, and some people do. Um, some people do. Um, anyway, uh, the. Uh, the adults, a typical bark beetle, the adult goes into a tree, makes some kind of uh, a gallery underneath the bark, like, like uh, all bark beetles do, and uh, the larvae will then, the eggs will be laid there, and the larvae will tunnel, and you'll get this very loose network of larval tunneling, and can be several layers deep in the uh, cambium and uh, cork cambium. Uh, uh, you can have tunnels on top of tunnels. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, they will exit through these very small holes. Uh, and, and we can talk about how to uh, detect if you have a tree that might have this. This is one of the first things I will look for, these really tiny exit holes. And then if I peel away, I can see the, the tunnels, and uh, then you can maybe you know, find the beetles or culture the fungus from the tunnels. Uh, the walnut the twig beetle, despite its name, uh, does not just hit twigs. Uh, this one uh, can hit all the size of them, ultimately uh, fill, filling the trunks of trees. Uh, so it's, it, it's a little a misnomer in terms of that name. It's got that name because all other beetles in this genus are pretty much all, all of them are on the conifers, but they are limited to twigs. This one's not, this one's acting differently, at least in black walnut it's acting the, uh, here's the Here's the larva, here's a larva underneath the bark. And this is the little chamber it was in. And this chamber looks whitish, and that's the spores of this fungus. And they are externally contaminated uh, with the fungus uh, while they're under the wood. And uh, when they emerge, they've got the spores on their body and they carry it when they move to the next tree. The fungus, Geosmithia morbida, uh, was discovered by uh, my colleague in 2009. He's found the last piece that in order to figure out what was actually killing all our walnut trees, he discovered this new fungus. Uh, new, newly described, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a case, it's always been here, we just didn't know it because we weren't looking for it because it was sitting in uh, obscure walnut species down in New Mexico. Um, but it's a, it's a member of a big genus of, of, we're finding many, many more of these geosmithia in lots of plants. This is the only one that's been causing problems though. This is the only pathogenic geosmithia to date. So these would be the uh, beetles, another picture of beetles underneath the bark exposed. There's actually a pupa, but here's a beetle that's just turned into the adult stage. And again, uh, all this white material, that's the spores. A lot of spore production can happen underneath the bark. So a beetle has been developing under the wood, gets lots of spores on its body, and then it moves to a new tree or a new part of the tree and introduces the spores when it blooms. So it goes in, and then this area here, so here would be a tunnel. This area here that I showed you, all that uh, dark area, that's the canker that is produced by the <coughs> fungus. So the beetle's making the wound, but then the fungus is killing tissues beyond it. That's a, a dead area called a canker. <clears throat> and the, uh, uh, so it grows considerably beyond the entry point. Sometimes the beetles just go in and make a little feeding point. This is probably what uh, happened maybe here, just went out, that one here, just went in and maybe fed and backed out, and then they inoculated that so you get a canker, another canker. Um, the, uh, so you get these uh, uh, pockets of uh, marbled, uh, 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 dead tissue, uh, it may vary. And sometimes we do see differences on different sides of the tree, more on the west side and sun exposed to uh, But it does not go very deeply. And uh, another important point I'm sure you're, you, you, you're interested. This does not affect wood quality. It, will, it could kill trees or cause trees to die back, but the wood is fine. This is not going to cause staining. It is not going to cause any, any weakening or anything. It just kills the trees more rapidly. Uh, if you get it, that was something you never do. So ultimately, you get so many cankers and their growth uh, uh, to uh, coalesce and, and uh, girdle the tree, mostly uh, affecting the, the phloem cambium, but sometimes it'll go a little into the, into the xylem as well. Uh, but again, very superficial, very shallow. And the reason it's called thousand cankers is, I don't know if you've ever heard of death by thousand cuts. So death by thousand cankers. But actually, it's death by a hundred thousand cankers. But anyway. Uh, that's, the, that's the reason we call it thousand cankers. Uh, I didn't know, but I thought it was kind of clever. Anyway, what we'd see in the early stages, and again, this is what we're seeing in the, in the western part, where uh, we first did, uh, we, we described this in 2000, uh, yeah, 2009, described it from what we've just been seeing in the western. You see flagging, just a little, and maybe a little dieback, uh, a little dieback here. That's the only uh, symptom we would see of a tree that might have, have effects. Uh, uh, in, in early stages, um, and these, of course, are pretty difficult areas to sample, but if we could, you could see, I'm sure, lots of little exit holes up there. A uh, little tiny flagging up here, that might, that's, that's the thing we were looking for in our surveys, to find out how, how widespread it was when we first realized what the heck we had. Um, not much. Um, uh, maybe uh, you'll see collapse sometimes in midsummer, uh, apparently invading, invading into the, the uh, xylem some. Uh, we'll see lots of flagging uh, abruptly happening. Uh, but uh, a lot of times, uh, these uh, parts of the plant that may just look thin this year, they may look like that all, all, all year, and the next year, it's a dead branch over winter, it dies over winter. Uh, but 
uh, it can be fast. In our area, this is this is, this is what got us. It can be fast. So here's some crown symptoms in the, in the tree here. In July 2009, this is a dead tree at that street. Uh, uh, that's in southern Colorado. This is one uh, in the western uh, suburb of Denver where there are, there's not a single black walnut left in the western suburb of Denver. They're all dead. It's running through Denver now. It's got about 70% of the ones in Boulder, but all the western suburbs, are, there's not. Anyway, this is one in the town of Wheat Ridge. This is what it looked like in June 2008. That's what it looked like in September 2008. And that's what it looked like the next year. That's, so that's, that's the stuff you see that scared the pants off of. And, I mean, it, it, it's killed a lot of trees. So Boulder is the town. It's not killed all of them, I'll tell you. And, it's kind of, and, and there'll be another nice thing. It's kind of plateaued in Boulder. But uh, Boulder keeps the best records of any of our city that have uh, uh, black walnuts in them. And uh, this is the percentage of the walnuts that have been removed in, in the city uh, over the course of 2001 to 2010. Uh, and you can see it's about 60% in a fairly short period of time. It, uh, Denver came in quite a bit later, and we're in, in this early part of the curve there, so it's somewhere up here now. Um, but, uh, I mean, our, our historical reference point is Dutch elm disease, and it's the same curve. We're, we're losing black walnuts at the same rate that we lost American elm and Dutch elm disease. And that, you know, we all know that Dutch elm disease was a bad thing. So this has really been serious for us. Um, now, getting back a little bit more on this, and, and again, I'll try to be positive again. That was supposed to scare you. But it's a serious problem. It's, left, it's not spread of any more than it, it is already. Um, Thousand cankers, again, it's produced by these two organisms. And uh, uh, the geosmithia fungus, has always been found with the walnut twig. So wherever we find the walnut twig, we will find the fungus and vice versa. These things are never apart. I don't think we can think of them as, as two separate things. Regardless of where we, where we go, where, you know, anywhere we sample, you can find both together. Um, and the disease uh, develops from sustained introductions, not just one inoculation, sustained, you know, inoculation after inoculation, that's how you get the disease. You've got lots and lots of hits from beetles over time, causing cumulative damage to uh, the tree. And uh, uh, that will produce the symptom you see. So, you know, who's, you know, what's the most important of these two species? I, you know, it's, it's interesting, I'm a bug guy, so I, uh, I tend to think that the uh, uh, fungus is more important. And my plant pathology cohort thinks that the beetle's more important, but they're, they're, they're both important. You can't separate them. Uh, they're both uh, part of this. So, and the corollary, I think I've already alluded to this, is if you find either of the two of if you find the, the fungus, you know the beetles here. If you find the beetles, you know the fungus. They're not the same. Um, now, let me just, I did mention Dutch elm disease, and, and I think this is a, uh, a, 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 an example of a, a, a situation where an insect transmits a fungus to a tree that most all of you would be familiar with. So let me talk about how this is different. That's kind of like the, the standard paradigm of insect fungus disease issue on trees in North America, but, but this one's really kind of different. So let me kind of do, go through that. So the Dutch elm disease, which you're familiar with, does have a pretty different <coughs> epidemiology in some ways. Uh, the DED fungus, Dutch elm disease, DED, if I say TCD, that's sometimes it's like, that's thousand cankers. I just fall into like a lingo and I'll say it and not be thinking. Anyway, but TCD, thousand cankers, DED, Dutch elm disease. Anyway. It grows and results in plugging the xylem. Uh, so Dutch elm disease is, is uh, mostly uh, xylem disease. Uh, and the beetle, uh, uh, the fungus grows in galleries of bark beetles uh, in a tree that has Dutch elm disease. So these would be spores of Dutch elm disease. And beetles get, again, externally contaminated. Uh, but generally, in the case of Dutch elm disease, uh, infections occur when the beetles do a little bit of twig feeding before they go into the trunk or into the wood. And then they make a little cut in the top of the tree, smear some spores in that are on their body, and the tree then gets infected uh, systemically. And one beetle, one wound, could infect a tree with Dutch elm disease and could kill it, which would lead to its death, ultimate death. All you need is one beetle with uh, Dutch elm disease. Uh, and usually starts at the top. Whereas tree death from thousand cankers results from overwhelming numbers of individual cankers, individual events, not one event, thousands and thousands and thousands. So that's maybe a little bit of good news. 
Uh, time to death, this, this is going to vary. Um, it can take a long time for a tree to die, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And you know, I think, of course, would be uh, considerably slower here than what I have seen. Uh, but what we were seeing uh, in the first five years is pretty much every tree that we saw any symptoms on, any kind of yellowing, was dead within three years. Any, any. It's been different elsewhere. And it's also slowed in some communities. But uh, anyway, getting back to the two differences, the duck elm disease uh, grows systemically in the xylem, and thousand cankers is cambium. Occasionally may enter a little bit into the xylem, but it does not grow systemically. And uh, so one of the things with Dutch elm disease that made it even worse than it was is its ability to uh, move from tree to tree through root grafting uh, because it could move right through the whole tree. And uh, uh, that is not, and, and so you'd have, you know, one tree could have been infected and boom, the whole row went down through root grafts. That's not an issue. Uh, we may see lots of individual trees dead in a row, but each one of those are killed by their own sequence of colonization by beetles. Not by moving tree to tree to tree through the roots. But the end result has been pretty much the same in our area. So, what are factors that are going to affect this disease? There's a, a couple of things that uh, could affect the course of the disease, and uh, how serious will be. A big thing, uh, I'll talk about some of these uh, throughout later, like natural controls. Obviously, the number of overall populations of the beetles, you have high numbers. Uh, you can uh, 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 rapidly uh, produce lots of cankers and if you have low numbers uh, less. Uh, bigger the host will probably uh, be related to how long it tends to uh, takes to die. But these will go in perfectly healthy hosts, by the way. This is not an insect associated with stress. They'll go in perfectly healthy tree. Uh, but resistance to the host, cultivar differences, species differences, let's talk about that. Uh, unfortunately, the big uh, one that this disease seems to whack is black. It is solely a pest of juglans, uh, and but I mentioned. By the way, so here's here's some other juglan species. Uh, these are this is the six. These are the six species of juglans that are native to North America. And the two that you'd be uh, uh, aware of probably would be the um, black walnut, uh, juglans nigra, and maybe butternut, uh, juglans cinerea. Uh, however, there's four others that are found in the western U.S. Uh, Two of them in California and two in uh, 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 Arizona walnuts, New Mexico, Arizona. Little walnut is uh, uh, in the Texas. Um, so these would be, this is Arizona walnut in the red. I'm, I'm not sure about these this, these two, but this is this is the essential essential area where I've I've been reported is right in here, and it, it reportedly extends down to New Mexico. There is a um, this is these little tiny spots here in the LA area. That's Juglans California. That's Southern California walnut. That, I think, is also a native host. There's a, there's a Northern California walnut, um, uh, Heinzii, just little tiny blue spots here. This Juglans regia, that's, that's the walnut we eat, uh, well, the, the Persian walnut, English walnut. That's not native. Uh, and, and then these areas over here is where a little walnut grows, is native. This is, uh, east, this is black walnut. This is the one we're talking about, really. That's what you think of in walnut. That's eastern black walnut. It's the one that is just awesome for uh, uh, wood. The most valuable thing I own is a walnut table in the George Nakashima. Uh, anyway, love the wood. And of course, it's got many other uses uh, uh, in addition to uh, furniture, uh, and including nuts. It, it's an edible crop. Some people eat them. Uh, now, a bit of good news. Um, there, is, uh, uh, there is a range in juglans in terms of which ones are more susceptible or which are less, and also other nut crops are not susceptible. So this is not a disease of pariah, which would be uh, hickories or would be um, pecan. So here's, here's a beautiful pecan, one of the only ones we've got in the state, but here's, here, this, this is the town of Only Springs where there's dead trees everywhere, dead black walnuts everywhere. Pecans look at pecan. Um, so it's certainly juglans, and among juglans, it's kind of hard to suss all this out because uh, it's really hard to get spike sites where they're all occurring and you've got the organism. But black walnut is clearly most susceptible, probably butternut is too. Um, uh, intermediate uh, resistance would be the uh, ones in California as well as the European species, the uh, European walnut, the, the English walnut, the Persian walnut. Uh, little walnut is probably intermediate. Uh, and then highly resistance is the one that, that I 
spent most time with the name stands Arizona walnut. Where, uh, uh, we can find the in insect, we can find the organism, but it doesn't kill, ever kill the trees. So I think thousand man cruise is re uh, results from the differences in susceptibility primarily to geosmithia. So this is, for instance, is what a canker would look like in black walnut, where it's essentially undefined and the, the fungus grows uh, uh, relatively unchecked, where you get real nice compartmentalization on a uh, resistant host. This would be uh, so this would be the wound made by the beetle and the fungus grows, but then gets uh, uh, walled off by the tree. So that's what I think we're having, that's what, that's what we get when we get resistance. The ability of the tree to wall off the fungus is going to be the ability to uh, resist this disease. Uh, and that is widespread in these native hosts that's always occurred. And, and, uh, Arizona walnut or Southern California walnut would be the two. Uh, I'm also, I'm not sure if I'm going but we're also seeing some compartmentalization. Every once in a while, we see a tree that survived, and that one is compartmentalized too. We don't know why. Now, just a little background again, uh, where did this come from? Well, the twig beetle was originally collected in 1896 down here. So this is a native insect to North America, to the U.S. That's where it was first found, described uh, about 30 years later, but that it was first picked up back then. So we know it's always been here. Uh, so it's definitely native to, and where that was collected is, is the species known as Arizona walnut, Juglans major. Uh, and this is Arizona walnut that's about as big as it gets. It's, it's not nearly as nice a tree as black walnut. Uh, and uh, the wood's okay. Again, not nearly as good. Uh, it mostly grows along riverways in little, little canyon areas. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of people don't even think I went to talk to some foresters of the U U.S. Forest Service down in Arizona and asked where this, I might find this. And they said, I, I don't know. I think we have some around here. And it was everywhere in canyons. But foresters never look at it because it's not a, it wasn't a pine tree. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> in the West, that's the only one that uh, anyway, uh, anyway, moves everywhere in the canyons. But it wasn't much to, to you know, talk about. It was a small tree. Um, so I did a lot of surveys early on down there. And uh, uh, we could uh, regularly find it. You know, you can find it there in the trees. Not very often. You kind of look. And, and we look for like, a branch that looked like a little flagging or is overshaded, maybe got uh, broken in a windstorm or something. Uh, and uh, walnut twig beetle in Arizona walnut functions as a typical pityophorus beetle. These, these, be these twig beetles in this genus typically, why they're called twig beetles is they just are twig pruners. They're, they're mostly uh, uh, feeding on, on, on branch limbs that are already damaged, they're overshaded, something like that. They're, they're nature's pruners. That's why they're called twig beetles. And that's how it functions in Arizona walnut. We never see it uh, develop into full-blown thousand tankers disease, meaning it would progress to kill the tree. It's very different in these native hosts. Um, the uh, Southern California walnut is also probably a uh, uh, native host. I think it's pretty, and, and again, this is the one uh, originally pretty much around the LA area. There's still a few left, my friend, friend my brother-in-law's place. In fact, uh, has some of the very few ones that are still left in the LA area, but they are hanging on. You can find a beetle in there, find a couple of cankers, but no big deal. Um, and this records on this host date back to the 50s, but again, it's probably native. And the, uh, uh, again, the difference uh, uh, in, in these different hosts uh, with the fungus is, is that it reacts quite quickly. But these native hosts, it gets compartmentalized, and thousand acres uh, in black almond does not. Uh, we assume Geosmithia morbida is also native. Um, you know, it, it wasn't described until 2009. But <coughs> Well, that's because nobody was looking, and uh, you know, once they looked, it was, it was everywhere. So we assume that's always been there. This is not, this is not something we can blame on came from China or came from France or something like that. So many. And uh, genetics work is being done, and this is supposed to show these colors are different haplotypes, different genetic uh, mixtures of uh, the fungus, and similar uh, graphs have been done, of, uh, or similar studies have been done with walnut twig beetle, but they're not published yet. Anyway, but they basically show the same thing. There are at least two main populations of both the fungus and the beetle. There's what's called a West Coast population, a Southwest population. West Coast one would be uh, originating in, in California, probably it's originally associated with Southern California walnut. The other one associated with Arizona walnut. Uh, Eastern thousand cankers infestations so far have been 
West Coast uh, genotype, which is not surprising since almost, almost all of them can be traced when they can be traced to somebody bringing walnut wood from California uh, into uh, Ohio, into Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, so we expect it to be a couple of shortages. Uh, however, our area, or Korea, and we're at, we got multiple. We, got, we evidently somehow have got multiple introductions. So, why did Thousand Cactus become a problem in Black Walnut? Somehow, this beetle that was sitting down in these, these obscure jubilant species down in Arizona and New Mexico and Southern California was able to move into a new host and then move uh, elsewhere. Uh, assisted by humans, and the new host would be more susceptible kinds of bone. <coughs> um, so, uh, you know, originally we were finding it all over here, and, and uh, uh, basically how it spreads is like, like a <coughs> big bang of buckets. Okay, those are the like two ways that this thing spreads. A big, uh, big bang would be a natural event, and I am not uh, totally. Uh, I totally discounted this. I mean, I think in, in our region, which is pretty wide open, I mean, we get the, the, the right kind of event. We see insects moving hundreds and hundreds of miles. So it's possible that uh, uh, in the Rocky Mountain states, uh, many of the infestations resulted from natural dispersal through some really favorable wind event at just the time when the beetles were in flight. And because people had planted black walnut out in the west, suddenly there was this other host. So then it became investment. However, uh, human assisted spread, the butthead uh, movement, uh, that's Beavis as a butthead, um, anyway, uh, is involved in, in, in the most significant spread of this. Uh, and always will be. Um, uh, and, 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 and walnut wood is, inc is incredibly infectious, uh, and even if it's infectious. The beetles readily breed in a fell of law. Um, so, for instance, these are two logs uh, about uh, well, six inches or so in diameter, about 18 inches or so long. Two logs I had uh, got from a tree um, early on when we were looking at this from Colorado Springs. Again, there was no more left. Um, but, and then uh, just kept them in a box so they could cycle on the, on the logs. And, and we had beetles coming out for uh, 18 months in those logs until, and, and, and they didn't come out after that because there was nothing left. They totally destroyed the candy. And uh, how many beetles came out in these two logs? We've got 23,040 beetles, which, which is equivalent to about six per square centimeter of bark. Anyway, um, a lot. Anyway, so this stuff is hot. Yeah. Wood that has these beetles uh, that will breed them, and you move them, and uh, it, uh, it can it can spread. Now, plan A, when we first had this, is, is uh, we would uh, somehow we'd try to prevent it from spreading. It was on the uh, was in western U.S., and we have this wonderful geographic barrier known as the High Plains, and uh, the deal is we will not give you um, <coughs> volunteer beetle if you don't give us an Deal? It uh, doesn't work either way. We just got an But anyway, um, some, somebody, somebody needs it. Uh, and, uh, in 2010, I said, good news, walnut twig beetles not like, is likely not to reach the native range of Juvenile Snyder, we think. However, July 20th, 2010, was the first um, uh, report in the native range was Knoxville, which is like in the center of the uh, known range of uh, native range of Juvenile Snyder. Uh, found it there July 10th, I come the next week with uh, my colleague Ned and looked at what was happening there. And uh, at that time, uh, it was just about in Knoxville, but the next year they, they looked they could find it six counties in the Knoxville area. Clearly that had been there a long time. By the way, in these trees, uh, a lot of them uh, looked like this. Um, some were dead, but a lot of them looked like this. And they uh, had just thought it was drought stress. We thought it was drought stress for a while, too. It was not. Uh, uh, and when they started looking, because we put maybe at that, that year we started putting out notices on this to look for it. And a, and a very sharp forester in uh, uh, Tennessee picked up. Uh, subsequent to that, there have been quarantines put up by states. The federal government has, has washed its hands of this uh, because this is not an uh, exotic insect. This is not, this is the, 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 
APHIS will come in if it came from China or Europe, <coughs> but not if it came from New Mexico, which, by the way, is part of the United States. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, and, and subsequent to that, actually some states have put in quarantines. Uh, the first one is Missouri. Missouri and Kansas, the first one, which Missouri was really stupid. It's a huge problem. Way. I mean, they, they're way number one in terms of black and white value, and Ohio's number two. Uh, anyway, uh, Indiana's number two. Uh, anyway, so subsequently a couple states put quarantines, and this is as of uh, a, a year or so ago, I don't see Iowa on this list, but uh, all the other states here have quarantines that uh, prevent wood from states that do have thousand tankers moving into their state. That's what those quarantines are. State quarantines to say, you know, here in Wisconsin, you cannot bring wood from any of these areas that have thousand tankers without making sure that it is absolutely not the best uh, Ditto with Illinois, but again, some others. But uh, it is now in some other states, and you could add, again, that little spot down here in Ohio, it was right near a veneer mill. Uh, some of these uh, issues, the veneer mills, they, they bring this, uh, the wood that they're bringing in is these uh, uh, nut tree. Uh, stumps that the, uh, the uh, English walnut grafted onto a uh, usually uh, uh, black, uh, black walnut or, or uh, maybe uh, anyway, a susceptible host, and uh, then they uh, ship them out to eastern veneer mills to get really because it's really where the, the uh, graft unit occurs, you get some really nice uh, wood. <coughs> Interesting wood there for it. Anyway, so veneer mills have been a big uh, a place you, you, you expect a lot of wood from California. Move to. Uh, you know, the, the big issue with this, unlike uh, uh, Dutch elm disease, is walnut is a very high value wood. Um, and elm was not. I mean, when we had uh, Dutch elm disease, it was, uh, you know, I mean, take my tree, please. You know, you can have it. Uh, but that doesn't occur with walnut. So, salvage of black walnut wood and human transport is going to be a continuous challenge for this disease. I mean, we've got, this, is, this is how it's going to move. Uh, uh, it is so often used and, and transported as whole logs or unfinished slabs, and these can be, uh, for instance, this is, we caught this on, on uh, Craigslist in Boulder, nice cut slabs. These, these are, you, you can bet that these are loaded with developing bark units right in there. And anyway, that got caught, and that they were told to just use them locally, keep them, you got to keep them local, don't, don't ship those out of state, but uh, who knows how much of them. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the log I said. This is Uncle. This is the log uh, in Denver. Uh, waiting for Uncle Benny from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's, here's the deal. You know, people, people out there. The, the, the tree gets caught, and then Uncle Benny, the woodworker in Chicago, is uh, coming for Thanksgiving, and they say, Hey, why don't we we'll give this great big log to Uncle Benny, and he'll make us a nice table or something. And then it goes to Chicago, and then you. That's so. So that's the kind of thing we're doing. So I think, you know, again, I've been saying this again and again, but long distance movement of walnut wood killed by thousand tankers disease will always be a huge issue due to the high value of the saw logs and the wood turning pieces. Um, so yeah, these are going to be just whole logs in the process of the middle of lumber, for near production, for wood turners, some for firewood. You know, we worry about firewood for them in the last four. To me, it's it's the high value stuff that is going to be moving around. Um, and and to me, I think wood turners are, are, are a big, important group to reach on this. They, they you know, have a real love for really nice pieces of wood and, and uh, will will uh, try to acquire these. And, and it's been my experience when I've talked about this that they're very uh, concerned that they don't move uh, uh, wood that could be infested, but a lot of them don't know about it. I mean, one of the very first things I did uh, when, when, uh, we, uh, when we were aware of this is I went to a a big wood turning conference that takes every place every year in Provo, Utah. Right? National, it's one of the biggest two or three wood turning conferences. People of all over the country come. The, the night I got there, they have a wood swap in the parking lot. So everybody brings their funky, cool little pieces of wood from all over the country, and then you swap it with somebody else, and then you go home. If you had walnut wood from a place that weighs beetles, you just swapped it into another state. And that's, that's the, to me, the main uh, 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 route of entry or uh, into new areas. 
So, um, some management issues related to South Yankees disease. Uh, what's happening with this? Um, uh, bad news for me it, it is I don't think we are going to be able to control this well with insecticides, even if we wanted to. And there's a couple of things. That, I mean, it may be, there, there might be some use, yeah, there might be some use here, were it to get here. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But, but not much. This is not, this is not well amenable to insecticidal control. Um, you know, I, I, I make the point that it, it takes sustained <coughs> introductions to cause the disease to occur, uh, to start seeing symptoms. So therefore, you, you know, it could be interrupted. You can interrupt it and get no more attacks than, you know, you can bring it around. So in theory, if you can kill beetles, then you can kind of stop the progress of the disease in the tree. But, uh, it, you know, and, and so you, you might be spraying the trees, uh, that would be one thing. You do some kind of bark beetle spray. The, uh, however, in our area, this has not been working. People have done this. This is the very first thing we recommended back in the middle of 2000. Uh, and, and people have tried a lot. And, and there's the, the big thing uh, involved here is the, be the beetles fly over months, months and months and months. Uh, so you would need multiple applications uh, uh, to cover a tree in order to bracket the entire flight. Now, there are probably periods when most of them are flying, like in our area, it's usually August, which is not as good as this slide. But the big thing, long period of flight, so if you're spraying a tree and uh, insecticide it persists for two months, you have to do it every two, three times to, to really get it. Anyway, has not worked at all in our area. I mean, tree care, tree care people were doing this, and it was not working. But we have enormous numbers of beetles uh, and, and overwhelmed even people in best attempts. It might work where there's not quite as much pressure. Um, left on lots of assays on different insecticides, carbaryl 7, permethrin, astro, bifenthrin, onyx, tallstar, something like that. Anyway, look at all these. Imiclover was ineffective in the lab. Uh, it, it, the other thing would be with the spray whole logs and see how many successfully came out of the logs. The only thing that works well, the only thing I would, I, that consistently comes up on top is bifenthrin as a spray. That's onyx. That's a tall star, a couple generics now. Um, you know, if, if you could use a systemic insecticide, that is, you know, obviously that's a, that's a big great idea because then we have to spray trees. At least if it's a street tree, which is what I mostly dealt with. Uh, but it's not working either. And, and I don't think it could work. I mean, first of all, there have been essentially zero cases where systemic insecticides applied in the soil have worked to control any bark. And with this one, I, I think one of the issues we have is when the beetle goes in, it inoculates the fungus, the fungus kills an area ahead of it, and that area that is dead because of the fungus canker <coughs> will never take in insecticide. So the insect can develop all at once, but then a fungus kills the canker there. There's no insecticide that will ever go there, even if it's going to other areas. And, and uh, we, we do not have a lot of chance to evaluate it. We've got one spot where we can do this. Uh, hundred trees, they're about equal age, or at least they're fairly adult trees on one boulevard in Denver, and we're treating a quarter of them with the mid and we're treating a quarter of them with Clopan, and then we just arena, and then Clopan's merit, and all other stuff. Um, and uh, a quarter of them are rejecting, but uh, starting to reject. We've been doing this for four years now, and uh, there, more trees have died on the treated trees than the other tree. So it's not working. And I didn't think it I don't know about the injection. There are injection trials. You know, maybe that endomectin benzoate might work with, uh, as, as a last resort. It, it is so super on and on after the triage. Uh, but another issue that comes up, if we're even talking about insecticides, is, is uh, this, this tree is in a really weird nether world in terms of regulation because it has so many uses. So what kind of crop is black walnut? You know, you can get it's a near, it's, it's uh, you know, it's used as it's whole pieces of wood that are finished into various uses like gun stock, and it's a nut crop. It's a nut crop. You know, $50 million nut crop in Missouri alone. Um, and so what kind of crop is it? Well, the federal regulations are, are regulating this as a nut bearing crop. Black walnut, you may be growing as a forest tree, but federally, it is being considered a nut crop. Therefore, the only insecticides that legally can be applied are ones that can be used on nut crops, which 
doesn't necessarily limit uh, uh, too many options. I mean, these are, again, scientific names for all these, but metaclopin, clopiamidin, bipetrin, that's the onyx, merit, arena, abamectin, avid, the triage. I mean, th these can all be allowed to be used on nut bearing crops as long as these residues do not get exceeded <coughs> in the nut. Um, and some of the soil injection uses would exceed those levels. By the way, dinotopurium, safari, xylem cannot be used on walnut. <laughs> That's the one systemic insecticide I thought might work pretty well, but it's off the table because it's not registered. Um, so, I do think prospects for effective control of walnut twig beetles are poor. Insecticides might slightly, slightly slow, but will not stop the progress of PCD. That may be different, again, if it, if it ever gets to you. What I would suggest, one of the first things to be done is somebody do a study in terms of when the insects fly in the area. And we've got a trap that can do that. And, and uh, a spray well timed for the peak period when this flies, and maybe you know, a fairly limited period, would probably have a lot of effect in, in working. It could be used on or weapon. But you're not there yet. But I think that's, if we do ever get there here, that there might be a spray that would work for you that is not working for us. Um, good news, it takes a long time you know, to kill trees quite quickly in our area, maybe, maybe uh, five, six years, maybe more, and, uh, considerably more elsewhere. Unfortunately, by the time you symptoms appear, you can assume that the whole, the, the beetle is everywhere. You know, if you start to see one tree, you just, you know, it's been a while, then the thing is all over. So if you, you, if you lost the game, you were thinking about containment. So if, it, if it's there, containment's out, off the table. It's, it's way more, just like animal dashboard. There's no way we can really know where the edge of the infestation is because we're under the tracks. Same thing here. Once it's in an area, it's in an area. You're not going to get rid of it. Uh, we do, originally, we do some surveys. You know, we look for a little you know, top crown symptoms like that and get them out. And again, a big thing that I'd like to, to, to look for would be these uh, uh, exit holes, tiny exit holes on wood that had thinner bark. By the way, really nice in sub uh, Wisconsin folks have a really nice uh, out of 10,000 tank. So pick that up if you haven't seen it already. But uh, one of the vendor groups. Um, there is uh, more recently, and this could be used, uh, this is actually a lot better for detecting if the beetle is here, um, uh, the, uh, is, is a trap that came out. It is not a super attractive trap. It probably picks them up no more than about 150 uh, feet from a tree. Uh, but if you think there might be uh, insects uh, along the beetle on that tree, uh, you can get a trap with the available lure, and you would probably get beetles in the trap. It might be a lot harder to get to find beetles in the trap. So, so these traps are okay for uh, uh, maybe getting a, a head, heads up on terms of whether they're actually here. So if you have a suspect, if you have trees where you're in a suspect area, I would say get traps. That's the easiest way to pick up the beetle. And if you pick up the beetle, you got it. Um, uh, you know, and I, you, you'd also want to probably then confirm, and, and most states require you to confirm it in the tree and find the down list, the whole thing, make the absolute 100% documentation that you have it. But if you get a beetle on two beetles in the trap, then you, uh, you, you can go on. Uh, bad news again is uh, end stage wood is extremely infectious. And this, people can move it around. Um, so a lot of work we've been doing is trying to figure out how do you handle this work. Um, and, and again, some of the time, some of the, some of the audience we've got are cities who want to kind of slow down the disease, and then others, of course, would be how to uh, uh, handle this wood and still be able to use it. And basically, you know, looked at a couple of different things: um, uh, debarking, chipping, heat, cold, insecticides, submergence treatments, a little bit. It, on chipping, which of course you probably don't want to use, uh, but for cities we do. Uh, chipping does not totally disinfest the wood. You can still get beetles coming out for nine weeks out of chips, at least put through a regular chipper. But after nine weeks, you don't get it. Whereas if you didn't chip it, they'd be coming out for two years. Um, uh, but of course, it destroys the wood. Same with barking, and, you know, first of all, how do you do bark or walnut? Has anybody ever tried that? They're pretty darn hard. And mm -hmm. even if there's little scraps they can develop in it, and, and it, you ruin the wood because it checks, it, you know, it dries out. So why would you do that? Um, heat treatment. Uh, heat treatment will kill them. Uh, you can get them 140, 150 degrees and hold it for 30 minutes uh, uh, Fahrenheit. 
hold it for 40 minutes, uh, 30, 40 minutes, and that will uh, kill all the all beetles and the fungus in a lot. Now, having said that, I mean, and that's not surprising. Heat treatment, you know, is pretty pretty standard for disinfecting lots of wood ovens. Now, having said that, what we're looking at is after we have heat treated the log and killed everything, if we expose them to beetles again, can we get beetles breeding in the heat treated log? Well, I don't know if they're breeding, but we can get beetles coming out of those logs for nine months. So if, if you had a whole log that was treated and then beetles came on it, there would be beetles on it when you moved it. There could be beetles on it. So you have to, if you heat treat it or cold treat it, you have to keep it away from being exposed to uh, new beetles if you want to think about moving it. Uh, same thing with cold treatment. Rock deep freeze. Putting in a freezer, you know, to zero degrees Fahrenheit will probably kill it. Kill almost all of them, if not 100%, very close. Uh, I'll talk about that again. We've uh, tried sprays again on logs and solarization and you know, diesel on logs and things. The only thing, the only thing that reduces significantly the number of beetles coming out of them, a log that has beetles developing in it, is by all the that includes carbaryl, permethrin, and metaclopril, biodiesel, can't get the solarization to work, which doesn't, you get, we get sun in our area, and it still doesn't work. Um, and, and. Dunking it out, ethanol, which may seem kind of silly, but some workers do that, that kills them. No, but, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, put, put them in, 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 in an ethanol bath for a couple days. They, they, they. Put them in water for a week to 10 days, they're not dead. They, they don't drown in the law that you have to put them in the water. But if it's boiling water, it should have in 20 minutes. So I boil, I boil a bunch of logs in my kitchen sink. When my wife was gone, they sure did. And I bought a special pot. It turned totally black. Uh, anyway. anyway. Now, so this is, this is the more hopeful ending part uh, I want to get to, um, is that uh, some things have happening with this that are are um, kind of an interest and, 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 and I say it, it is is there maybe a, 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 a chronic phase of this disease in addition to the acute phase the acute phase would be when it comes in and, and that's what's happening in my town right now Fort Collins Colorado just came into the city about three years ago this is the her deck classic acute phase seeing symptoms trees are dying very quickly you have a lot of trees are dying right now right this year and have been just the last three four years. But in other places, they're not, or they've stopped. Uh, and that would be the chronic phase, where it doesn't go as aggressive. You know, so this is the classic acute phase, you know, that this June, the September, the June of the next year dead. That's a classic acute phase. And, and again, that's that is still happening. Uh, but in one of the uh, places where I first saw uh, thousand campers. There's a little town called Rocky Ford. It's furthest east in the state where it occurs now, down in the southeast. So here is the tree uh, that I've been following. Uh, this is the, the uh, walnuts are all, uh, these are a whole bunch of walnuts around the city center of the city park. And uh, almost all of them got taken out over the last five or six years, but there's a couple left. And this is the one I've been watching. So this is what it looked like in 2013. Again, all the other ones are dead in the town, the town where it's 90 percent. But this one, there, there it is, uh, this uh, August, here it is the year before, you should say, this is the same picture, 2013, that's uh, year before, year before, year before. So here it was in 2010, here it is in 2014, or 2013, excuse me, sorry. Uh, I, I just did that just before I came here. I'm still sleepy, I never had coffee. Okay, 2013, so it's four year progression. Same tree, not a lot. It stopped, and it's really hard to find beetles in that tree. Something has happened. So in some places, something is happening in our area. Boulder, too. You know, this, it's plateaued. We're, they're using very few trees now. They had a, had a real period when whoosh, they were losing tons of trees. And now it's plateaued. This, to me, is probably the most interesting question we've got to figure out in, 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 uh, in regard to related to this disease. Why would it go to this phase? Uh, uh, and in our area, you know, natural, you might think natural enemies of walnut tree beetles increase the suppressed numbers. I can't find them. There's, there's not enough. That's not the answer in our area. Could be in your area. I'll come back to that. 
Uh, maybe there's antagonistic organisms that suppress the fungal partner, Geosmithia morbida, and maybe these build up in, in certain trees over time, so there's another fungus that competes with it. Maybe, or, or I think it's maybe in, in some trees there's some form of induced resistance. Some trees have some genetic capacity or something allows them to uh, more effectively uh, have an induced resistance so they can compartmentalize it. Anyway, it does exist. Uh, there is some ability to uh, 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 wall off this disease in, even in our area. Now, how will thousand cankers, TCD progressive eastern and northern areas where it's wetter and where it's colder? Um, well, you know, I, I, I went back to Knoxville last year, you know, and uh, uh, after I went there in 2010, so that again was also four years later. And, uh, you know, some of the trees I would see that uh, I'd see symptoms on were dead in 2010. They had symptoms that are dead. Some, not very many. Some of them would stabilize uh, with a lot of dieback, and some of them had very little dieback. So, then, uh, and, and, and very few had died. Very few had died since 2010. Now, Knoxville is an area that I think actually has had this disease for quite a long time, as I think I maybe said, uh, having been found in six counties the next year. Uh, so maybe, you know, it's taken, it, they lost a lot of trees 10 years earlier and didn't call it right, which they didn't pay attention. Uh, but the 4,000 acres have been in bed. Uh, if it gets here, where we are, how will it progress in this dry state region? Well, a couple things. Um, temperature, I think, is going to be limited. Um, now, in the lab, the adults and the larvae will be killed in the lab. Their super cooling point is, is about minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit. And we all know it's gotten a lot colder than that this year. However, that has to be minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit where the bee lives, in the tree. And it takes a lot longer for a tree to freeze to minus 2 and freeze the beetle in there. You know, other, other tissues have to freeze, the water in the tree has to freeze, and then it gets there. But, um, and even in our area, we've seen considerable survival uh, occurring when we've had events where it got to minus 20 plus degrees uh, in the wintertime. You know, so it, it doesn't kill, you know, but, but one or two day uh, event at minus 20 doesn't kill. You. But years like you had this year, which were so awful, and I've heard Nothing but complaints from everybody I've talked to about how bad it was this winter here. Um, anyway, I mean, a, a winter like this probably would whack this insect. Not kill them all, but whack it seriously. More so than Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, I, this is, remember, this insect is native to Southern California and Arizona. This is a warmer season insect. So if you're at the northern edge, I think you might, uh, if, if it gets here, I think when you get events like this, that would seriously uh, 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 whack it and take, take it uh, back a couple of years. That's a good thing. So just put on an extra coat and get over it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> killing, killing at least this, not a lot of other bugs, but he's killing that bug. Uh, also, I, I think you know, the forest you got here, there's, there's at least two different things. You got much more uh, complex forests, uh, biodiverse forests, than the situation that occurs in the West. Um, and a couple things will happen. One is there's a lot of general predators of insects, like uh, uh, the insect up here is called clarid beetle, which is a bark beetle predator. You know, you know, tons of clarid beetles are running around the forest eating other kinds of bark beetles, and suddenly they kill uh, well, uh, twig beetles. Uh, probably the higher humidity is going to uh, uh, provide conditions that would provide uh, be favorable fungi that might compete with or be antagonistic to Geosmithia morbida. Yeah, all this would slow the project. My swag, which means either scientific wild ass gas or stupid wild ass gas, <laughs> TCD will, will likely have considerably slower course in, in this part of the country than it has been seen in some other areas. Uh, I, yeah, but I just made that up. So take it for uh, uh, what that's worth. Uh, short term priorities uh, for this disease, I think, is containment, uh, identification of effective wood disinfesting uh, 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 treatments so that people can salvage wood and use it and, and turn it to um, in commerce, they don't have to lose it, and exhaust the evaluation of all pesticides that might be appropriate for this. Uh, big thing is slowing the spread. I mean, this is, I'll tell you today, this multiple times now, they slow the spread. I mean, when we first got it in Knoxville, I mean, this was a really bad day when we found it. But if you calculate, and I think we're being generous, that on its own, uh, it would move east 
to west on its own no more than about two miles a year. It would take 256 years to get to uh, Columbia, Missouri uh, from Knoxville. And I think it was about 150 years uh, to get to Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, or Lafayette, whatever it is your name. It would take a long time on its own. It likely would take a fair amount of time. But, uh, and we have quarantines that now can, can uh, uh, at least provide some empowerment to stop human <clears throat> assistance spread. But this is always going to be an issue. I mean, you know, it, a, a city is always one truckload away from being invested with this, as it is with them with that. If somebody brings wood in, you know, that's it. So that's what we've got to stop. Um, so, store, so uh, in our area, we say you know, store it locally, use it locally. That does not mean you can't put it in trade. And again, I, I don't know what those state regs have. But wood that does not have the uh, bark on it, it's milled, that's safe to move. Not so certainly safe to move. Beetle doesn't care, neither do care on that. Wood that is, is disinfested uh, and not exposed to beetles uh, uh, would be, so it's been treated in a manner that's killed all the stages in the wood uh, and has not been stored in a site where walnut wood beetles can recolonize it, then whole logs of wood can move. And, and that means heat treated, probably, is the main thing. Or, I don't know how long it would take, maybe three years, uh, for a tree to, to dry on its own and no longer be able to support this that's, that's a study that would have to be done independently here. It takes, in our area, where we have much drier conditions than you do, uh, uh, we probably, the longest we've got beetles coming out of the log has been uh, two, uh, a little more than two years. Might be a little longer, might be even shorter, though, if it's in more humid area. I don't know. That's got to be figured out. But um, an old log is probably not going to catch but in, in the first year, that's toxic. That is toxic. You, you move that log, and you have just uh, caused a serious hurt in wherever you move it. Uh, ongoing education training sessions, I think, are going to be uh, very useful in all this. And at least there are opportunities for this. Uh, I, I, I really, you know, I hope the woodworking community is aware of this and uh, should, to, in my mind, be one of the main focuses of any educational efforts. More so, this is a woodwork. This is not a, I don't think, you know, mostly a firewood issue. It's a, it's a people using the wood, because it's good wood. So, so it's short term priorities. Long term priorities are more containment, more effort. You're just, that's, that's the, and then uh, uh, develop potential biocontrols, resistant cultivars. One of the things we have people looking for right now is, uh, I mean, not wherever we go in the West, like they say, I want to hear about it, about surviving black walnut, that, where everything else is dead. One, the whole, they're all dying in this town. There's one that's left. To me, that might be genetic gold. That could be the one that's got something that allows this thing to be existed. And then we can put those in breeding products in the long term. Uh, so there could be hope there. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a there's a, a, a nice uh, a lot of information on thousand cancers disease in the uh, National Walnut Council uh, website. We have our own website, and I think they link to it, but. Uh, this is my department. If you want to get to our Thousand Cankers website, uh, you got to go to my department. This is the name. It says BSPM CSU if you want to get it on. I won't say the name because I hate the name. The department formerly known as Etymology, but anyway. Uh, hit the outreach button and you get Thousand Cankers. We've got uh, sheets on, uh, fact sheets on how to detect it, uh, uh, the questions and answers about it. I've got examples of all that here. Um, uh, by the way, I also brought a few posters. I couldn't carry up many on my uh, in my luggage, but um, I have some posters that maybe some uh, agencies or, or organizations that you might want to have one of these. And if you want more, you contact me later, and I can get you more. Um, a thousand cankers disease, nice sturdy stock, uh, good for uh, sealing up holes in your wall, <laughs> keep the draft out. Of these cities. Anyway, uh, and if you want to contact me, that's my. Uh, so, um, I think that's it. Those are the main things I want to say. How about some questions? Can I get questions now, Jesse? You have five minutes. Five minutes, okay, yes. I'd like to make so, a clarification so, on your map concerning the quarantines. Uh huh. Um, in Iowa, since 2010, we have listed both of the thousand uh, maker um, with the geosmithia and the pityanthus as quarantinable pests in the state of Iowa. Good. So we do not have a quarantine that does not restrict or it does not restrict the movement of walnut, but we are restricting that we do not want those pests brought to the state of Iowa. Okay. Um, so, is there questions over here? No. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> change Iowa State. I, I, I can't remember, I think I pulled that off the National Army Council site last year. So, um, I, I don't know what you got. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned that the soap logs and alcohol or the soap logs and water, you know, the, what, what effect that had on killing the insect. What about uh, soapy water? Uh, detergents, okay. such as the detergents that's used in pressure treated wood today. Well, okay, so the question was like, on these uh, soapy things, uh, what were they in water, the, and what about the soapy water or detergents? So, I, the, the, I, did, I did put a wing agent in with the water one. Um, uh, it, was just a, it wasn't a detergent, but it was a wing agent to improve it. But it, it's still, it, I, I just think there's, it just doesn't penetrate, maybe a long time, maybe months, but that water was really funky after. Ten days, and they were—they're still beetles that came right out. In fact, I think we're getting to one of still holding this. I think we're going to get beetles out of those logs longer than the ones we did not treat because they're more humid, and, and they, you know, so the others have dried out, and those ones are last long. So, I don't think it's going to work. I mean, that'd be another. Yeah. Uh, I didn't ask him. Bugs Rule Book. Where's it been? Any good bookstore. It just came out in September. It's a book I use for um, uh, my uh, class, uh, Insect Science and Society, Bugs for Thugs, they call it. Fine. <laughs> Everything. Uh, it retails for 55. It, uh, uh, I, it, I'll, buy, I, I'll sell it for 45. Contact me. I'll sign it. Cheaper than Amazon. <laughs> don't, don't buy it from Amazon. Okay. okay. I, I know yeah. we have We're a done. lot of questions. We, we have to keep the day going, so I'll be the bad guy. Uh, he, he did say one very important thing. If we get walnut to a and you find a living tree, he made one error. Please contact me. All right? That's a million dollar tree. I'm your first contact. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. Thank you.